I had two very powerful parents. Uh, my father came from County Clare, um, attached cottage, literally in Cranny, uh, of a strong Republican background. So from a very early age, my father would have been involved in the IRA and in the various campaigns, the War of Independence, the Black and Tans, all of, all of, these, all of these wars. But he had very strong views about peace and even used to talk that perhaps 1916 wasn't a good idea, that it perhaps was premature, that perhaps we should have waited and possibly home rule. So it was ironic, he was actually a pacifist. I was very interested in horses and, and, and bred horses and, and, and rode, he was a very good horseman. Loved farming, loved nature, loved trees. Just a, a, very, uh, a very interesting man. My mother, by contrast, was, came from a very wealthy background, Protestant stock, Northern Ireland. So there was a huge collision of cultures between Republican, basically peasant uh, background, and this aristocratic lady who originally, her family would have come from Belgium and connections to the royal family there. And just, yeah, the love of animals, the love of nature would have brought them together. My mother was a good horsewoman, hunted roadside saddle. My father would have been a very good horseman, hunted, um, jumped for a while with the equitation school. Horses are the great leveller. So from a very early age, I, I, I was a witness to this divide uh, where my mother would value people on a weighing scale of their class, their status, their accent, the way they dressed, what they... It was very noticeable as a small child that people were being weighed up on a valued system that didn't seem to be fair. So I actually felt for a long time that I was um, a stranger in this family. I actually thought I was adopted. I remember finding an old suitcase and knowing that this was obviously where files were kept and actually looking to find actually my birth cert uh, and being relieved that I actually was in fact a member of the family because I actually didn't really fit in. They would have had their difficulties relative to issues of class and I would have seen as a kid the nonsense of class the rich poor divide in fact it meant also that because the houses were big that there would have been staff so i couldn't understand why i was very close to one of the the staff uh, he was italian uh, william Maringo, billy we used to call him and i speak stunned you know and upset how billy couldn't join us at the table to eat literally billy was like a, my father at times he was the one that would have bought the best presents at Christmas time. He was the one that bought the Beano and the Topper and the Dandy and bought the gimmicks and all, you know stuff that was made in China, which would probably break down in a couple of days. But he was a beautiful man, and uh, any of the people we ever had any contact with were were nice. Like the Billies of the world, the the, 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 the maids were, were were really nice people, and I I didn't see a divide. And I think my father was quite uneasy about that, but from my mother's world, that was the way it operated. I actually thought, and this is a strange one, but I actually thought that I was an angelic being, and I would sometimes look around the house at holy pictures, because there was some nice artwork in, 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 in the various houses, and in those days, the beautiful little paintings of, you know, around the edges of uh, maybe a painting of the Madonna, they would have lovely little, like, sheriffs and really... And I would be looking to see, could I recognize myself or one of them? I immediately, you know, joined the choir and became an altar boy, very much in the quest for, for some lost world and would have had a vocation uh, you know, for the priesthood or becoming a monk. I, I just had this sense that, that if we are spiritual beings, which I've always reckoned, you know, we are, we're spiritual beings having human experiences, 
why not develop that? Why not develop the spirituality? We originally lived possibly one of the nicest houses in this country called Seafield. Seafield is now known as Seafield House, designed by Cecil, a lovely Pierce, who designed the GPO uh, out in Dunabate. Uh, absolutely extraordinary house with clock towers, courtyards, statues, pleasure grounds, peacocks. That house was sold and then Altamont was bought and the billows was bought at the same time. But as just as a small child, with a child's logic, you, you, you felt, well, if we are spiritual beings, why do we not develop this? What's all this nonsense about upper class, lower class, about wealth? Why are my parents like living this life in entertainment and people coming and and I would know just from listening that obviously there was a cost to that. It was expensive running houses and I just felt like, you know, why not like sell everything and live like in a attached cottage? I was the youngest of eight and I think by the time my parents came to me, they would have been quite tired of children. My father sold the house in, in Dundrum, Altamont and moved to Kilkee. And it was more about him than us. The fact that I was 11 and I would have liked to have stayed on in Dundrum, that's where my friends were, and to have gone to the local secondary school. So that was never factored in. And I was shipped down to this boarding school in County Waterford. And I found it very difficult to fit in there. And I, it was very difficult because People had different valued systems to me. Uh, it wasn't very fair the way things were run. There was a lot of brutality, a lot of very bad beatings. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was nothing to get slapped six times on each hand with a cane, uh, with a strap, to get boxed around the ears, to get knocked to the ground and kicked. The sexual abuse came in the form of, they used to have visiting priests who would come and run retreats. And it was the usual fire and brimstone. And I was very young going to school, I was only 11. So even a lot of what the, these retreat people would be talking about was over my head. They were talking about, you know, masturbation and bad thoughts. And I had still, I really hadn't entered that world yet. I was still quite innocent. And when I did become aware myself of, of, of sexual feelings and masturbation, and just the high stakes that there were involved in, 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 in those days, that if you uh, died in a mortal, in a state of mortal sin, you went, you went, you went to hell if you had a bad thought or an impure action, and that's a very heavy load to place on on kids, and particularly on me. I found it really unfair, and I remember being quite worried about all of that. And there was one particular year I was probably about thirteen, fourteen, actually going to hear, con have my confession heard by the uh, priest that was running the retreat in the parlor. Because there was a, a sense that if you went to the confessional box, it was quite informal. And I remember figuring out, because this man came across as really nice, um, hell's fire stuff, but at the same time quite nice. I thought maybe it might be an opportunity for me maybe to just talk out some of these issues. And to my horror, he, he molested me, opened my fly and, and felt my genitalia. And uh, whatever way I responded or recoiled, uh, he stopped. And I remember disengaging as quickly as possible and leaving that parlor. And as I was walking out, there was a, there was a, a door open into a bedroom. And I remember thinking, oh my God, you know, I could have ended up there. And of course, you never talked about these things. It was only years later, when I went back to our reunion, that I decided I'd actually go around and ask people where they actually abused by this guy. And it turned out there were large numbers where he had the full Monty, anally uh, penetrated and all sex. So we went as a group to the president of the college and said, like, have this guy removed. 
So obviously that particular incident was a turning point for me. I decided, oh my God, is this what is going on? And that particular incident for me was a turning point, a huge line in the, in the sand and created then all kinds of difficulties for me because if I wasn't going to be a priest or I wasn't going to be part of the religious culture, what, what, what was I going to do? I always knew that, that I was different, that, that I could see the bigger picture. I had a tremendous sense of, of justice, a fair play. Would have been very aware as a small child about Africa. For some reason, Africa played a, a huge part in, in, in my life as a child, the black baby phenomenon. And I always vowed that if I ever I became an adult, that I, I would find some way of contributing to Africa, which in fact is what I did. The Africans are possibly the most heart-centered um, people I have ever come across in my life. They live completely in the heart. They're unbelievably brilliant with their children. I mean, both men and women, they're fantastic mothers and fathers. And they make, they make, they make such perfect eye contact. They look you straight in the eye and you know that you're connecting fully to this person that is connecting with you when you look at them. So energetically, it's very easy to be close to the Africans. I would, I would think of Africa every day. A day would not go by and I wouldn't think of Africa. And I just love the fact that Africa is where we all came from. I came from there and my DNA came out of there. So I felt very, very at home in Africa with the African people. And there used to be a surprise to me sometimes when I'd be palpating an abdomen of a pregnant lady to actually see my white hands on, on or was percussing someone's back. I'd say, oh, and I'd say, well, yeah, yeah, of course. But I just merged. You know, I've spent some time in India, very different energy, um, more, more mind and ego where the African, it's more, it's more heart, very, very hard. It's more love, uh, more compassion. Yeah, and that's why it's very, very sad to see them involved in so much conflict now because of the arms trade and the weapons and it's poor Africa. It's bled dry and, 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 and we have contributed to it. It's very tragic, but just as a place to go, I brought my children out there a couple of years ago. I didn't want to go to Uganda. It still has too many traumatic memories for me. But I brought them to Tanzania and to Kenya. I brought the kids out to the Serengeti and we were traveling in a Jeep and we stopped because the wildebeest were migrating. And the Serengeti, the Maasai call it the endless, the endless ocean. And it is an ocean. It's, it's hard to describe its size. It's vast flat, this beautiful savanna grass blowing and abundance of game. So we're watching the, the wildebeest migrating and they were actually crossing the road so we stopped and there had been a kill uh, by a line of a zebra because the zebra travel with the wildebeest they're the ears and they watch out for things and the wildebeest sense the rain. So they travel almost in a symbiotic relationship together. So we had stopped and we were watching the kill and there was a lightning storm away in the distance and there was flamingos flying into a little lake. And I said to my youngest boy, he was, I think he was 12 at the time. I said to Julian, I said, Julian, do you think this works all of what we're seeing now. Do you think this works by human rules? And he just turned to me and said, Dad. And I said, it's, it's not true that if a wind came and blew us off the planet, and every human being as well, off the planet, this would still be going on. He said, exactly. And that was probably the most powerful teaching moment I have ever had with my kids to be able to say, this consciousness, this life force, is bigger than us and is operative 
and we can choose to tune into it or not. 